the Son of Righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings. What does that statement have to do with the hem on Jesus' garment? And why did people seek to touch the hem of his garment? And how can you touch the hem of his garment? We're going to talk about those questions today on Karis Daily. Those of you who have studied the scripture are probably familiar with the story of the woman with the issue of blood. The woman who said to herself, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be made whole. Luke 8 44 specifies that that's where she chose to touch. She didn't even touch the person of Jesus, but his garment. And in Luke 8 44, it says that she, well, I can start in 43 for context. Now a woman having a flow of blood for 12 years who had spent all her livelihood on physicians and could not be healed by any, verse 44 now says, came from behind and touched the border of his garment. She touched a specific place on the garment. She touched the border of his garment and immediately the, her flow of blood stopped. And that's when Jesus said, who touched me? And goes on where he says, daughter, your faith has made you whole. So the woman told herself, and you can read different accounts, Matthew's account, Mark's account, to get the big picture of the story. But she told herself, if I can just touch the hem of his garment. What was it about the hem of his garment? Now what some people don't realize is that the woman with the issue of blood, she's the only specified case and the most famous case of those who touched the hem of Jesus' garment. But she was not the only one. There were many people who touched the hem of his garment. Scripture tells us in Mark chapter 6 and in verse 56, I'll turn over there because I want you to see it. Mark 6 verse 56 says, Wherever he entered, into villages, cities, or the country, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might just touch the hem of his garment. And as many as touched him were made well. So the woman with the issue of blood was the most famous among those who touched the hem of his garment because it's the one case the Bible specifies. But this is something that was recurring, which is probably why the woman heard and had the faith. Well, I'll touch the hem of his garment. Other people are touching the hem of his garment. I don't even know why they're touching the hem of his garment. I'm kind of reading some into the story, but she probably did not know why the hem of the garment, but I'm sure she'd heard people say that they've touched the hem of his garment. They've been made whole. And so faith stirred in her and she said, well, then I'll touch the hem of his garment and I'll be made whole. And she did it as a last resort, spent all her livelihood on physicians trying to get healed, seeking for some type of remedy or solution to her problem. Now, I don't believe it should ever be a last resort for us to turn to Jehovah Rapha. A lot of times people do turn to him as the last resort. But I can guarantee you, because it says here in Mark 6, 56, wherever he entered, wherever he entered. So this was recurring. Into villages, cities or the country, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might just touch the hem of his garment. So people are saying, we want to touch the hem of his garment. And so she hears This is probably, and I'm speculating, reading some of the story, but it it is written in Scripture that many people sought to touch the hem of his garment. So it would stand to reason that this woman would hear. Faith comes by hearing, and when she heard, she probably thought, well, if they're touching the hem of this man's garment and being healed, I'll touch the hem of his garment and be healed. She probably didn't even know how it would work. I can guarantee you she didn't know how it would work. But you don't have to know how it works in order for it to work for you. That's the beauty of the simplicity of the gospel. You don't have to know how it works. Just like when I eat, which I'm good at doing, I'm very good at eating. I have a supernatural gift for eating. When I eat, I don't know how it works as far as how all the nutrients go throughout my body and, and benefit my body. I just eat and it works. I don't have to eat, or excuse me, I don't have to know how it works in order for it to work. I do have to do something. I have to eat and ingest the food and let the food do what it does. But my job is done once I've partaken. It's like when you put seed in the ground. The Bible talks about in Mark 4 where the farmer puts seed in the ground and it sprouts and he sleeps by night and rises by day and it says he himself does not know how but the seed produces. And so you don't have to know how this works in order to get it to work 
for you. So I can guarantee you the woman with the issue of blood didn't know how it was going to work, but she'd probably heard people say, well, this man is having people touch the hem of his garment. Mark 6, 56, he's going into cities and villages and they're putting the sick in the street and people are asking to touch the hem of his garment. Why the hem of his garment? This is just what they're doing and when they touch the hem of his garment, they're made whole. And so she hears, faith is stirred. Again, you say, where, where are all those details? Again, I'm, I'm reading into the story, but you can imagine based on what's written that other people tried to touch the hem of his garment. Why the hem of his garment? I will get to that question in just a moment. But first we see that she, she says, again, you have to read Matthew's account, Mark's account, and Luke's account, and combine the three accounts to see the full panorama. But she said within herself continually, if I touch the hem of his garment, I'll be made whole. Now, there was a little bit of taboo in her touching anything or anyone. You probably, maybe you've heard other teachers talk about this, but it, it bears repeating even if you've heard it. There's a law in Leviticus, and I want to invite you to turn with me to Leviticus chapter 15. And it's talking about the law governing bodily discharges. It's not a very pleasant chapter to read, but it's an insightful chapter because it does apply to the story of the woman with the issue of blood. And so Leviticus 15 and in verse, we're not going to try to read all of this, but in verse 19, it says, If a woman has a discharge, and the discharge from her body is blood, she should be set apart seven days. Whoever touches her should be unclean till evening. Everything she lies on during her impurity should be unclean. Everything she sits on should be unclean. Can you imagine the shame of having a condition like this for 12 years, and everything you touch becomes unclean? The shame, not just the inconvenience, not just the pain, not just the frustration, but the shame. Everything I touch becomes unclean. And in and, and the law, there were all these rituals in the Mosaic law of what you had to do with something that had become unclean, whether it's breaking a vessel or all of these rituals. Imagine the shame because she has to tell people legally, what I've touched is unclean. I'm unclean. Everything I touch is unclean. Man, what a terrible image of yourself to carry for 12 years. And so it says here about someone, a woman who has a discharge of blood, Leviticus 15. And again, we've already read 19. 20 says everything she lies on during her period should be unclean, everything she sits on. Verse 21 says whoever touches her bed shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean till evening. That means all the physicians that tried to help her had to go through the rituals of cleansing just because they had been around her. Man, think of the shame knowing that the physician who's working with me right now is going to have to go through a ritualistic cleansing just because I'm making him unclean, just because he's with me. What a terrible, terrible plight. And so this is the context of the woman with the issue of blood. We read on further and get down to verse 25. If a woman has a discharge of blood for many days... Of course, we're talking about 12 years in the case of the woman with the issue of blood. Uh, other than at the time of her customary impurity, or if it runs beyond her usual time of impurity, all the days of her unclean discharge should be as the days of her customary impurity she should be unclean. But then verse 27, whoever touches those things should be unclean. He shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until evening. This condition became the plight of the woman with the issue of blood to such a degree that she had to tell people, anyone that touched anything that belonged to her, her bed, her couch, she had to warn them and say, hey, you're unclean now because you've been around me. And now you've got to go through ritualistic cleansing because you've come near me. And so this is a terrible situation. And again, all of this story is here in Luke. I'm holding up my Bible as if you could see it. But anyway, Luke chapter 8. But you have to go to Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Combine them all to get the big picture. And so I wanted to kind of build the context, even if you're familiar with the story, just to show you what devastation this woman endured for 12 years. Now, she makes a decision. I'm going to touch the garment of a rabbi. Now, in touching the garment of a rabbi, she's going to make the rabbi unclean. But we're not talking about just any rabbi. We're talking about the one that if you touch him, you don't make him unclean. He makes you clean. But she's willing. Her faith is so strong. And anything she touches, she knows that, that she's not allowed to touch. Especially, you can't just walk up and touch a rabbi, let alone in your uncleanliness. 
And so she runs up to him in faith, knowing in her heart, probably if I touch him, I'm going to make him unclean. No, that's not true. She knows in her heart, if I touch him, I'm going to make, I'm going to be made whole, which means I'll be made clean because she's been hearing people are hearing, are touching the hem of this man's garment and they're being made whole. She goes up, she touches the border, the hem of the garment, a very specific place on the hem. I'm going to get to that in a moment because scholars agree that it was a very specific part of the hem known as the tzitzit. And I'll explain in a moment what that means. But she goes uh, to the rabbi, she goes to Yeshua, and she has an expectation because of what she's been hearing. People say they're touching the hem of his garment, they're being made whole. And so she's willing to run the risk. No, I'm not going to make him unclean. He's going to make me whole just by touching the hem of his garment. Now, this brings us to our question, why the hem of the garment? Why would people reach out and try to touch the hem of Jesus' garment? It's because of who they believed him to be. There was a prophecy in Malachi, and I'm going to take you there. It's the final book of the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 4 and verse 2, it's a messianic prophecy telling of the forecoming of the Messiah. But to you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings. Now the word there for wings comes from the Hebrew word kanap. And that word kanap could either be translated like the border or skirt of a garment, or it could be translated wing. So when it talks about hiding under the shadow of his wings, it's using the word kanap. But it also means the skirt or border, the edge of a garment. In fact, that word is used, if you were to read the story of where uh, David approached Saul in the cave and Saul was asleep, and David reached out and cut a part of Saul's robe. And when he cut a part of Saul's robe, and, and, and took off that border of Saul's robe and kept the piece, that was called the kanap. That was the part of Saul's robe that David cut. Same Hebrew word. So it, it's the word translated wings, like the wing of a bird, or just like it says, we're under the shadow of his wings, but it's also translated like skirt or border of a garment. And so when, when uh, Ruth approached Boaz, she said, spread your skirt over me or your wing, take me under your wing. It's the kanap. And so this is what the Lord says. He's going to cover us under the shadow of his kanap. But we have here in Malachi 4, 2, that says he's going to have healing in his kanap. Again, same Hebrew word that's used in the story of David and Saul, where David cut the border of Saul's garment. It's actually part of the garment. And so there were people who believed Jesus to be the Messiah, and that belief in who he was and is, created in them an expectation of what they were going to draw and receive from him. It's the same thing as when the blind men, think about when the blind men would stand up and yell out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Why would they say son of David? They weren't just trying to show off that they understood something about his lineage. They understood the prophecies that the Messiah would be the son of David. And so when they made the statement, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on us, they were saying, Jesus, we believe you to be Hamashiach, the Messiah. And so because we believe you're the Messiah, we believe that it says when the Messiah comes, the eyes of the blind will be open. And we believe we can have our eyes open because of who you are. So there was an expectation built on a revelation of who he is, a revelation that doesn't come from flesh and blood. Who do you say that he is? Do you have a revelation that doesn't come from flesh and blood, a conviction of your heart that he is who he says he is? Well, there was a prophecy in the days of the Messiah, the eyes of the blind would be opened. And so when they made the statement, Jesus, son of David, that means Yeshua, ben David, and, and then it says, uh, he's the Messiah, Hamashiach. I know you're the Messiah. I'm drawing from you. I know who you are. And that's why I know what you can do. And that's why when Jesus said to the blind man, what do you want me to do for you? He says, open our eyes that we may see. Well, there was an expectation built around the revelation of who Jesus was and who Jesus is. And so I can't guarantee that the woman with the issue of blood understood. She probably just heard other people say, well, we touched the hem of his garment. We got healed. And there's other people asking to touch the hem of his garment. And so this, this woman with the issue of blood, she probably didn't say, well, let me find out why the hem of the garment, what is it about his garment? Maybe she did, I don't know. But what she said is, if they're touching the hem of his garment and getting healed, I'm going to touch the hem of his garment and get healed. 
And so why would other people touch the hem of his garment? Because it was foretold in Malachi 4.2 that the son of righteousness would arise with healing in his kanap, in his wings, in his, in his, the border of his robe. And so healing in his kanap, same Hebrew word, that part of the garment, okay? And they would have an expectation. When I touch that part of the garment of the Messiah, I'm going to draw out healing. He has healing in his kanap, healing in the border of his garment. Okay, now scholars agree that they didn't just touch anywhere on the hem of his garment. This is the consensus among biblical scholars. In fact, if you look in a Hebrew uh, translation of the New Testament or a complete Jewish Bible or, or anything of that nature, it will specify where on the border of the garment people would touch. It was a tassel called the tzitzit, and it was something that the Lord told Moses and instructed the people of Israel uh, to put on the, the borders of their garment, they would wear on the kanap of their garment, they would put a tzitzit, a tassel. So I have here a, a talit that I got from Israel, from Jerusalem. And you can see here that I have it on the desk. This part right here is a tassel, okay? And this is called the tzitzit. Now the Lord instructed Moses to have the people of Israel put this tassel on their garments and the instruction is given in the law in Numbers chapter 15. I want to invite you to join me in Numbers chapter 15 because we're going to see what the purpose of this part of the garment was because again, scholars all agree that it was this part of the border of Jesus' garment that the woman with the issue of blood touched, the other people that touched the hem of his garment, they touched it on this tassel. You can study it out. And there could be some who disagree, but that's the consensus among, among scholars that he had that... Uh, rabbinical seat seat that he wore and so people would seek to touch it so what is it about the tassel well join me in numbers 15 and we're going to take a look at this tassel where god gives the instruction and it was to be a white tassel with a blue thread so it's at, towards the end of numbers chapter 15 and you say well some of this is a little technical well we're building a point about why it was this part of the garment people would touch in numbers 15 starting in verse 37 it says again the lord spoke to moses saying Speak to the children of Israel, tell them to make tassels on the corners of their garments throughout their generations. So put it on the kanap, the border, the corner, the edge of the garment. Put a blue thread in the tassel, the tzitzit, of the corner on the kanap. So this tassel is a white tassel with a blue thread in it, and they're putting on the kanap, the border, the edge of the garment, the skirt, and then the tassel is called the tzitzit. Now, it has a meaning. It's not just there for fashion. The tassel has a meaning. And it's to remind them of something when they looked at it. So let's read what it's about. In verse 39, it says, You shall have the tassel that you may look upon it and remember. Remember what? All the commandments of the Lord and do them that you may not follow the harlotry to which your own heart and your own eyes are inclined and that you may remember and do all my commandments and be holy for your God. I'm the Lord your God. So now the Lord is saying the tassel, the tzitzit that hangs at the border of the garment, the kanaf, that tassel is meant to serve as a reminder for you to keep the law, for you to do the law, okay? So that's why it existed. Now, I want you to think about something for a minute. How many people who have lived, that lived under the law, ever successfully kept the law? Just give you a minute to think. One, Yeshua, Jesus, the only one that Galatians 4, 4 tells us that in the fullness of time he came born a woman born under the law. He didn't have to be born under the law. He subjected himself to that law for us, out of love for us. But he didn't even have to be born under it. But he was born under the law and he kept it, not only in his conduct or outward actions, but even at the heart level. Jesus kept the law perfectly. But there's no one other than Yeshua, the Messiah, who ever kept the law perfectly. So now let me ask you this. If the tassel that hangs from the garment, if it's meant to be a reminder to keep the law, but you've been living your life and you haven't been keeping the law perfectly, well, then let me ask you this. What does the tassel serve as a reminder of for you, the one who's been breaking the law? The tassel, when you look at it, will remind you, 
I haven't been doing a very good job of keeping that law. Because the tassel is there to remind you that you're supposed to keep the law. The Lord said, you can look on that tassel and remember all the commandments, everything I commanded you to do, and then it will keep you from looking at the harlotry to which your heart and eyes are inclined. You look at the tassel instead. That will remind you to keep the law. But let me just tell you that anything that's meant to remind you to keep the law, if you're not keeping the law well, it's going to remind you that you haven't been keeping the law. It'll serve as a reminder that I've blown it. I've messed up. In fact, it's a white tassel with a blue thread. It's almost as if it's been drugged through the mud because you realize I haven't done a very good job of keeping the law. But touching the tassel on his garment is a statement on multiple levels. Why? See, I'm supposed to look at the tassel on my garment to remind me to keep the law. But when I look at the tassel on my garment, it reminds me that I haven't done a good job of keeping the law. So what do I do? I look at the tassel on his garment. To touch it, I have to go low. Humble. Humble myself. I can't touch the, has the, the tassel on his garment without humbling myself and getting low. Now, when I look at the tassel on his garment, I'm reminded of his perfection, of how he kept the law at every point, fully without sin, even at the level of his heart. There wasn't even any sin found in his mouth. No deceit in his mouth. Perfect beyond measure. I want you to think of the beauty and the perfection of our Messiah. So perfect. Absolute perfection. And I can look at the tassel in his garment and I see his worthiness, his holiness, that he did keep the law. His tassel on his, his seat seat on his kanap, on his garment, shows perfection. When I humble myself and look at the tassel on his garment and reach out to touch the tassel on his garment, which Malachi 4.2 says, the son of righteousness comes, he arises with healing in his kanap, in his in his gar in his the border of his garment, but it, it's translated wings mostly. It's the same Hebrew word, kanap. So I see that he's got healing in his wings. Why? I'm putting a draw on his worthiness, not trusting in my own. I'm humbling myself saying, I've blown it. I can't do it. My tassel reminds me of how I've fallen short. My tassel reminds me of how I haven't done a good job. And if I stay in that place of looking at my own worthiness, I will never be in a place of receptivity to receive my healing. But when I go low, humble myself, see, I can look at my tassel without going low but I can't touch his without going low. And so in humility, I go low and I touch the tassel of his garment to say, I haven't done a good job keeping the law and I'm not worthy, but you are perfection. You were born under the law. You kept the law and there's healing in your kanaf and I'm putting a draw on your worthiness. My eyes are off of me and my shortcomings and they're on you. When you take your eyes off of your shortcomings and put your eyes on his perfection, there's no greater way to put yourself in a place of receptivity to receive your healing than putting your eyes on his perfection and getting your eyes off of your own unworthiness. Now, let me show you the difference of what the Pharisees would do. Here's one of the reasons why Jesus rebuked the Pharisees. You, maybe you've read this passage and not really understood what Jesus was talking about. But let me show you what Jesus was talking about in Matthew 23 when Jesus rebuked the Pharisees in love, but he was very strong in his words. So in Matthew 23, starting in verse 1, it says, Then Jesus spoke to the multitudes and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, in a sense enforcing the law of Moses, Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do, but do not do according to their works. For they say and do not do. They bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move, one finger, uh, move them with one of their fingers. Now, verse 5, this is really the key of the pride of the Pharisees. Okay, I want you to see what the Pharisees did, because a lot of people read verse 5 here in Matthew 23 and don't really understand what Jesus is talking about and the gravity of the transgression of the Pharisees and their pride. Verse 5, he's talking about the Pharisees. Jesus says, but all their works they do to be seen by men. And how do they flaunt their works before men? Read on. They make their phylacteries broad and enlarge the border of their garments. Now, the phylacteries are talking about, if you see Orthodox Jews, they have what's called the tefillin 
it's like a leather box that they'll wear on their on their head a lot of times with a little leather strap and it's got a, a section of parchment of the law inside of that box. That's what the tefillin is and that's when Jesus talks about the, phyla- the phylacteries. But the next part here in verse five, it says they make their phylacteries broad and they enlarge the borders of their garment. Now what does he mean when he says they enlarge the borders of their garment? If you study out what the Pharisees did and what Jesus was talking about in this verse, he's saying they would lengthen the borders and they would lengthen the tzitzit, the tassel, on the borders of their garment as if to flaunt their own righteousness and their own law keeping. So think of the pride of the Pharisees, how they trusted in their own righteousness, that they would actually lengthen, they would deliberately lengthen the, 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 the tassel, the tzitzit, on the corner of their garment, make it longer. Remember how I said that if you wear a tzitzit, it's supposed to remind you, this is the tassel, it's supposed to remind you that you're supposed to keep the law, but if you've been breaking the law, it serves as a reminder of the opposite, that you've blown it, you haven't done a good job. Well, the Pharisees would lengthen it to show that I am righteous. I have done a great job, and you should be proud of me, and you should aspire to be like me, because I keep God's law, and so they would lengthen their tassels. That's what Jesus meant when he said they enlarged the borders of their garments. You say, well, what's wrong with that? They wore baggy pants? No, they didn't wear baggy pants. They lengthened the tassel. You say, well, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with that is it was flaunting their righteousness, their works, and they will never trust in the Messiah and go touch the seat seat on his robe because they're too busy flaunting their own. You cannot trust in your own righteousness and expect to be in a place of receptivity. And so if you're in a place of saying, hey, what should I do to receive healing? Just like the rich young ruler, what can I do to inherit eternal life? What can I do What can I do? How about this? Quit trying to do, humble yourself, get low, and go and touch the hem of his garment and say, my own worthiness has fallen short. It's my own righteousness is filthy rags, but I will put my hope in your perfection because I know that the son of righteousness, because of your righteousness, you have healing in your kanat. And so I know you're the Messiah. I know who you are, and I'm going to reach out and touch the hem of your garment. And the only way to do that is get low, and say, I'm, I'm done trying to do this in my efforts because I'll never, and people that think I'm good enough, I'll lengthen my seat seat and show it off. Nope, how about this? I know how I've fallen short. I know it's filthy rags. I'm gonna reach out, put my hope in His righteousness, and that's where the healing is. That's where I'm in a place of receptivity to receive from Him. I hope this message has blessed you. If you want more, if you want to receive prayer, you can call out 719-635-1111. We've got prayer ministers who will be there. To minister to you, you can go to karisdailygtn.com, find out what our free offer is. If you're watching at the time of the broadcast, we have a free healing guide and other resources from Karis Bible College that you can partake of that will feed and stir your heart, feed your faith. And if you're watching video on demand, you can go on karisdailygtn.com and just see what the current offer is, and it'll be something that'll bless you. And let me just remind you that we're on Cares Daily right here for you, seven days a week, and we want to invite you to join us, different instructors who have powerful insights to stir your heart. So join us seven days a week. You are loved, favored, and blessed.